The lecture is about the students identifying themselves as learners to begin with and seeing in what ways they create barriers to their own learning and how they overcome those barriers in their learning and ultimately how reflecting on themselves as learners will support them in their development as teachers. The aim of section one is really to explore individual identities really to begin with. Many students um, are under the impression that teaching is merely a set of technical exercises but of course there's an awful lot more to becoming a competent teacher. So I'd like them to think about their learning, themselves as learners, the barriers they create and that have been created for themselves as learners, and to start thinking about how they'd like to be remembered as teachers in the future. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this lecture on what kind of teacher you will be. An interesting question. Well, I want to think about what teacher you're going to be, what kind of teacher. And you're all experts now. You've all been in education forever, and you already have decided which teachers you want to model yourself on and which teachers you think didn't actually have all of the attributes that you would like to share as a teacher. Well, think for a moment, and I want you to share with me any qualities of a teacher, any specific teachers you remember who you would like to be most like. So is there anybody here who would share with me the teacher they would most like to be like? My favourite teacher was when I was um, in high school, when I was back in Greece, uh, because that's where I finished my secondary education. And I used to talk my problems to her, and she used to listen. So she was my favourite teacher. A caring teacher. A caring teacher, yeah. Thank you very much. Somebody else? I had a fantastic teacher in high school. He was my music teacher. Um, and I think I liked him so much because he went over and above what he needed to do, I felt. I liked to sing, but I wasn't particularly good at it. But he saw that I really wanted to do it and he put in a lot of extra work to help me and to boost my confidence. It's another aspect of caring, somebody who cares about you as individuals, yeah. who sees you, an individual person, not as a group of people, but as one person who needs some, some special, special attention. Thank you very much for your contributions. Well, you know, I think you'll be thinking about who you want to be most like. And, um, and education over the last hundred years or so has made some specific movements uh, with thinking about children as, as individuals. There's a quote here on the board. It goes back a long time, 1916. This is from the Dean of the School of Education in Stamford. He's suggesting here that the schools are like factories, and he's celebrating the fact that schools are like factories. A bit like Ford at the time, celebrated because of this mass production line, beautiful cars coming off a beautiful production line, everything happening in its place, just in the right kind of time, and churning out a sort of common product right at the end of it. And, and people saw that as a great thing, and the thing they kind of wanted for education, sort of industrialized process for education. But is that what we think now? And I suspect, as people are going through a training process, it can seem a little bit like that's the message you're getting. The message you're getting is, as long as you tick the boxes in the right places, as long as you've completed the standards, as long as your learning objective is up on the board, as long as you've done all the right paperwork and your planning is in order, then you'll be a good teacher. But actually, is that the thing that sets a good teacher apart? Or is there something more than that? Something in the intervention, in the interaction of two human beings in two human minds in the learning process? Teaching isn't a series of tasks any more than driving is a series of mirror signal maneuver. When I travel in a car, I like to travel with people who driving has become an automated response. They don't even think about those procedures, they just do them. They're automatic and they're internalized. And for as long as we see teaching as a, se as separate, uh, as a series of separate technical exercises, I think we're missing the big point about what education actually is. I suppose also, when you came here, you thought, I'll go to Edge Hill and they're gonna give me the great book of teaching. They'll tell me how to do it, it'll all be written, I can just read the book and then I'll know what to go and do. And you're still waiting for that book. And you're starting to realize nobody's ever going to give you that book. And it's probably a good job, because I suspect if we gave you that book, by the time you got out there into the real world doing it, the book would be out of date. Policy would have moved on, children, education, life would have moved on, I don't know. Things would have changed. But what you are doing is you're beginning to write your own book. And that book will be, you'll go on writing it and changing it right throughout your career. You'll still be writing that book in 30, 40 years' time. There is a sort of a sense, though, that, that education is being really micromanaged. 
that policy comes and we have to work to the letter of the policy. We have to work to the letter of the strategy. And that there's no room for us as individuals to make a mark on our teaching. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think the one thing you can do as individuals is be yourself. The one thing you can bring to your class is you and your passions and your experience and your life and the things you know about that will make a difference to them and to their life. And this doesn't matter what age of people you're working with, whether you're working with adults or the youngest of children. In a sense, we still have a sort of an idea that education is a bit like a factory, where children go through all the subjects, where we kind of engage in all these different activities. And Ted Ragg, writing just a few years ago, um, made this comment. And I don't like it. It worries me that people could see education as factory farming, that people could see children as battery hens. That's really a little bit scary, I think, if that is what we want to do with them, that the idea of the factory hasn't gone away. Well, is that how you think of children? And I suspect it isn't. That's why you're here. But in all this stuff, the bookwork, the paperwork, which is there to help, it can feel a little bit sometimes like there is a factory going on. There's a lovely quote here from 1992 as well. And I love the middle bit. The sense of delight in intellectual activity, he says, has been replaced by a sense of urgency. The thrill of the hunt is converted into the efficiency of the skill, of the kill. In other words, we've forgotten the joy of the learning because we're so worried about the test. We're so worried about the outcomes. We're so worried about the league tables. We've forgotten to think about those things that happen along the way. Those moments of, rev of revolution, of change, those ti little times where you cause just individuals in your class to move on some way. Tom Bentley, who was a member and leader, I think, of the think tank Demos, um, also described education as being a machine. And he said, or schools as being a machine, and again, the children as raw products, with an attempt with standardized inputs and standardized outputs. And sometimes we wanted the machine to work faster, to churn children through this system quicker. I mean, we see it, don't we, as an advantage if children sit their GCSEs a year early. Well, why is that an advantage? What is the advantage in getting there faster, not getting there richer? We have to value the journey as much as the place we arrive at. Both are important. I just wanted to think about metaphors for the moment, and I wonder what metaphor you would have for education. Do you see it as a machine, as a factory, or do you see it as sort of something to do with farming, or something to do with growing, something to do with tending the land, something to do with a banquet? Just for a moment, talk with your, your neighbour, and just see if you can find a metaphor that would describe how you would like schools to be. Okay. Okay, what was the these schools are basically their farmings because we should give people time in order to develop because when we tend the land we are making some proper land basis for them and when we make the basis for them it means they are growing with the age with the maturity and they are doing you know I mean uh, with the environment as well okay I just wondered if I could ask anybody if they'd come up with a metaphor which would describe how they'd like to see education have you thought of something? Ours was a little bit similar to the idea of farming because we thought it was a bit like a flower because you have to look after it and like nurture it in order for it, um, a child to grow. So it's a bit similar. Lovely. So some very natural metaphors. And it would be lovely to share what metaphors that you came up with. And they may change and you may sort of alter them. But in a way, a working metaphor is quite useful. I want to think about then uh, what we do with children and how when children come to school at the very start, we take them, we take this sort of raw product of the child and start schooling them and what we do to them in school. Here's, um, here's a video I would, I would like you to watch. This is my daughter, Isabella. She's about eight months old. She's kind of level five in crawling backwards. She's pretty much level six in squealing and blowing raspberries, I have to say. Well, what about crawling forwards? Well, she's probably level three. And I've got a bit of a worry, because I'm sure that there's a standard somewhere that says she should be level five or crawling forward by the time she gets to her first birthday. Well, she hasn't quite got there yet, and I'm worried that she's going to miss the target that's been set for her. The trouble is she doesn't care about the target. The trouble is she doesn't care about what the agenda, my agenda is, for her walking by her first birthday. So somehow I've got to find a way of doing it. I could stand behind her and sort of help her along, but I don't think that's going to work. But I have found a secret. And the secret is, 
she will move heaven and earth to get at my car keys. And I'm starting to think, this is the way forward with her. This is the way I can make a difference. So I've used the car keys as a little bit of an incentive. You can see the desperation. She's even having a little paddy here, just because she can't quite get there quickly enough. She is absolutely, you can see the determination. <laughs> that is determination. How do we capture that? How do we capture that in school? I find that determination of children to make that progress forward in their learning so that we know what their agenda is. Now, little by little, she's going to fight every single ounce of the way until she gets there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she got there at last. And that's the point. She got there in her time. Her motivation was there to do it. And you probably find when you're in school, working in school, that the thing you want the child to do is not the thing the child wants to do. The child wants to play with the thing in their pocket or talk about the thing that happened last night. So what do you do? Do you put the shutter up and say, no, we're not doing that. We're going on with my agenda. Is that what you do? Well, we need to think about this and how we deal with it. So one place I might start looking is, is Maslow's theory of human needs the hierarchy of, of human needs. I find this quite useful. The bottom two levels of this hierarchy suggest something to do with individuals and the self, something to do with our physical well-being, our physiological needs, water, that we're breathing, for goodness sake. I mean, if we're not breathing, we don't need much else, do we? Um, but also to reproduce, and we need food. And we need that sense of security, safety. We need to know that we're safe, because if, if we're not safe, then nothing else is going to matter to us. And if we are hungry, nothing else is going to matter to us. Those very basic levels have to be secure. Now, Isabella, where was she? Well, she seemed pretty health, she's pretty happy. She's been fed and watered and changed and all the things that babies need. And she's ready to focus on her play. But she couldn't do that, for example, if she was hungry or if she was unhappy. So there are those first two levels. Then there's this, second, this sort of second stage. We start thinking about the child in relation to the people around them, a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of belonging to a family or a community. If you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling excluded, then very little else is going to matter over and above that. So in what ways are the children in your class feeling isolated or included? Because that's going to make a huge difference. And, and equally then, more than that, more than just being included, but actually being, having some kind of esteem. Now, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about PE and sport, because that's the one area of life where I don't feel included, <laughs> where I really don't get it. I don't know what they're on about when they go on the sports field and chase a football. I've never felt included in those communities, really. And, um, and I certainly don't have any sense of esteem within those communities. The question is, where do I have my personal esteem? What are the things that give me credibility amongst the people who I live with. Musical things maybe, I'm not great at it. I wasn't great, but I was included in those communities in school. The other sort of muso types in schools, they let me join their choirs and, you know, they, they talked with me about musical things, so there was a sense that I belonged to them. And actually, what I couldn't do is I couldn't beat them. I couldn't quite get my esteem, so I took a different direction. I left the brass players behind and I joined the choir singers. And in a way, what I was doing was I was beginning to think about my own personal ambitions, my, but my inner drive, my need for self-actualization, Maslow would call it, we might disagree, but it's a sense of that inner drive that we feel comfortable, we feel we're valued, we feel we belong, we feel we have the skills and the knowledge and the understanding of this culture that we belong in, whatever it is, to actually move forward and take our own ambition for ourselves. And I think this is what Isabella was doing with the keys. Everything was in place for her to feel comfortable enough to realize her own personal ambition of getting those keys. That was the key, in a way, to her making progress. And what I'm asking you to do is to think about the key to making progress with children in school. And more importantly, what are the barriers to them thinking about making progress in school? There's another model, and I think these models be useful when you're writing your book about teaching because they're just another way of thinking. And this is the behavior for learning model. And this one, this one rings really so true to me. I really get this. We talk about th children having three different relationships. First of all, the relationship with themselves. Now, me on the sports field, what's my relationship with myself like in that way? 
How do I think of myself as a sportsman? How do I think of myself as somebody who can really learn in PE? Well, it's pretty grim, I can tell you. I don't feel any kind of sense of self-esteem in that way. I don't feel any sense that I know what I'm doing or that I could participate with others. I've closed the door on it. I've shut it out, and it's something that is just gone forever, really. But I'm happy in a way because I know that there are other things where I have a good relationship with myself as a learner in that context. My relationship with others in that context might not be great if I felt pretty badly about myself as a learner in that context. And so the very fact that I don't get football, the very fact I don't get what the game is about, suggests that my relationship with that subject, with that curriculum area, isn't too hot either. So there are three different relationships, in a way, we need to think about with children when, when we're trying to get them to overcome whatever barriers they have to making progress. And there is, there's quite an interesting way of looking at this. Howard Gardner gives us a good way of looking at this. He gives us multiple intelligences. There are two ways of, of looking at multiple intelligences. One is that I could stamp you all with a, with a label and say, you know, you are music smart or you are bodily kinesthetic smart, but I'm certainly not going to do that because labels aren't opportunities. Labels are barriers in themselves. Howard Gardner talks about creating a new group of losers by labeling people in this way. What I prefer to do is to see this as a series of possibilities, that we've all got the potential to make progress in all of those levels. We all possess those capacities in different amounts, in different quantities, in a different blend. And that is totally liberating. That, yeah, OK, I might never reach the level to, be, to join the England baseball team or basketball team or whatever it is, but I can make some progress. There is still the potential for me to make progress, even though my doors may be closed. It's just the right person and the right situation the right motivation, the right opportunity, the right teacher, maybe, who will open that door for me. And so we don't close off learning by labelling children, nor do we close them off by labelling them as different types of learners. We see them as learners in all dimensions and across all these kinds of intelligences. And we give them a wealth of experience where they, where they address all these areas of their learning. Now, that is empowering. That frees them up to make progress. And you look at their progress, you value their progress, you tell them about their progress so that they know they've made progress. How do we do that? And I think we start with play, because that's where children start. What's the difference between play and work? For a child, there's no difference. Play is work. Work is serious. Play is serious. It's one and the same thing. You can't really separate those things out. You know, I saw a video recently, an education video, where the teacher, the head teacher, went into the playground. And at the end of playtime, she gathered all the teachers together. She said, right, children, time to stop now. Time to go in for learning. What you've just been doing on the playground is not important. It's not of any value. The fact that you were talking and playing and rehearsing your skills and your game skills, and you were negotiating and working out things together and inventing a new game, talking about things that are important to you socially. That's not important. The important stuff happens in the school, not in the school playground. That was the message she was giving, time to come in for learning. I think that misses a bit about what's important in children's learning. In section two, we start looking at uh, an exploration of roles. So the students will begin to think about what it means to think about the world through the eyes of a geographer or through the eyes of a historian. So they don't see the curriculum just as a set of, of activities, but they see it as a way of engaging and interpreting and understanding the world in which the children live. This picture here, um, this is quite an interesting picture. It's a child working on some artwork. And he's, it's a graffiti kind of art, isn't it? I couldn't do this. If I tried for a million years, I wouldn't know how to start. But he knows. He knows exactly how to do this kind of work. And he probably knows the technical terms that go alongside it. He probably knows the vocabulary about it. And he probably knows something about the whole style of, of graffiti art. I mean, I kind of think of it in terms of like a, like a child uh, with his father who's a fisherman. I think that's, that's quite an interesting uh, way of looking at it. You know, there's no difference between the child and the father, really. They're both just fishermen. They both go out on a Sunday morning, whenever it happens to be. They've both got the same sort of uh, kit. They know what the terms are for the kit. They know how they go about doing that kind of fishing. They know the sort of rivers they fish on. I don't know anything about it. But they will know. And there's no sense of one of them being level three and one of them being level five. They're, those sort of false 
situations aren't created. They're just fishing. And in a way, it doesn't matter. The child will get better. And the child knows the habits of fishing. The child knows the language of fishing. The child knows the jokes about fishermen, I suspect. So, in a way, this child is already immersed in this particular culture. And sometimes we miss those cultures in school. I had a boy in my class once who asked if he could sing in a, in a, a concert that was coming up. So I said, well, you know, what would you like to sing? He said, I wanted to sing a Green Day song. So I said, well, you'll have to sing it. He said, I need the keyboard. So I got the keyboard, put it down to his level, and he started playing his Green Day song. And the class sat in amazement because we had no idea that this boy could not only sing but play for himself while he sang at the same time. And there's an important reason why he could do it. He could do it because his brothers did it at home. Now, this particular child had a variety of, ne of needs, of individual needs, um, through, through, which, were, which were supported in school. But there was no question of his ability to do this singing. There was no question of his ability to, to do the musical thing because it was just inbuilt and ingrained in his home life. There was no separation. And the problem is many of the children, when they come to school, they don't get school. They don't get the language of school. They don't get the culture of school. They don't get what you're interested in because they're not interested in those things at home, perhaps. The culture of home, the language of home, the code of conversation at home is different to the code of conversation maybe in school. And that means that there's an automatic barrier, possibly, for some of the children in your class, just understanding what this is all about. And maybe you need to take time and share with them what this is all about so they can change their identity as a learner. And you can do that because you are now expert learners. You've been learning for so long, you know about yourself as a learner. You know about your barriers as a learner. And you can share that with children in helping them overcome their barriers as a learner. I wonder what specialisms you have. I wonder what things you're good at that you could perhaps share with the kids in your class. What would you like to share with them? It's not on the curriculum. But what would you share with them if you could? Just tell me anything you could share, what you're good at. Yeah, I like to play the guitar um, and I grew up with that in my household. My dad played the guitar and we all used to sit around and sing on a Sunday. My friends used to say we were like the Waltons. Yeah. Um, but that, that's something I would, I would like to bring into school and to show the children and I'm, to I'm share. I'm sure that having the guitar, just having the guitar in the house means that there's more of a chance that you are going to play that guitar than in a house where that guitar doesn't yeah. exist. And the fact that you can play that guitar, you hope you will take that into school, whatever you end up teaching. And I hope you will share your enthusiasm. Because it isn't about the children playing guitars, it's about the children developing their own enthusiasms and their own identity, whatever it is they do. What else does anybody else do? Thank you very much. Um, I enjoy singing and dancing. How do you think your interest in dancing, for example, could support your work as a teacher? Um, well, because I teach monophone languages, um, I believe I can bring a bit of dancing. I really hope you do. And I hope you get the, the, the kids you the work kids, with yeah, to work through language yeah. as they're dancing, as, dance. as they're learning a dance. I hope you'll share that passion with them and just sell something of you as an individual in, in that time that you're working with them. So they'll never forget you for that. They'll always be remembered, you'll be remembered as the teacher who danced with them. Thank you very much. So what is the difference of a child doing art in school, but the child is a real artist? What's the difference of kids singing in a choir in school and real musicians singing in a choir? I'm not sure there should be too much difference. Because if we see children's work in school as being a technical exercise, we miss the point of authenticity. We miss the point of them having a real motivation, like Isabella and the keys again, all over again. That is that, that sort of driver from within. In a way, when we're working as scientists, we shouldn't be worried about the task. We should be getting the children in school to work like scientists, asking questions like scientists, doing what scientists do. When they're working as artists, they're not doing a technical exercise in drawing a sunflower. Th those might be the skills that we share with them, but we need them to apply those skills, to look at the world for themselves and try and express that in some way through their artwork, through their sculpture, as real artists do and to put that work on display, not in the corridor, but to get parents in for a real art evening where we're sharing those artworks. And if I had a, a choir in school, yes, I could have a concert in my, in my school, but I didn't want a school concert. So I took the kids and I begged all the local choirs, the local male voice choir, and said, can we have a slot in your concert? So our concert was part of a local community concert. 
And if you can make those experiences more authentic, and more, they're more valuable, I think, in the process. So in what way can you get the children in your school to behave and think like experts, to wear this cloak of an expert? Not to be kids in school doing it. There's an organisation that works from a primary school in Scotland called Room 13. Room 13 is an artist studio where the children are entitled to go and work once their schoolwork, as long as their schoolwork is maintained. They negotiate it with a teacher when they can go to the art studio. The art studio is run by the children, but it's supported by an artist in residence. And the children go and work alongside the artist in residence. They have philosophy lessons where they discuss important themes for them, like what's it like being a child? What is nothing, was one of their questions. How old do you have to be to be an artist? So is a child in school an artist, or do you have to be 18? Or do you have to have been to university? At what stage can you call yourself an artist? I think that's really quite a deep question. And they represent that in their artwork. I think I've got this right. One of their artworks was a banana. And on the banana was written instructions of how to unzip the banana. Because kids felt they were so cosseted every step of the way, they weren't even allowed to work things out for themselves. Even the banana had to have instructions on it. That's how they felt about it. And this came out of this art studio. And there's a real authentic opportunity for children to make decisions for themselves. The other thing, of course, is that this opportunity allows them just to have chance, to celebrate chance happenings. Things that come along that can sidetrack us are wonderful moments. And allow yourself to be sidetracked, because those important things will not be forgotten. And they could be big things. They could be big, big things like... Uh, that, that are world incidents, and they could be local things, and they could be things that happen to the child. But be prepared to be sidetracked. We're thinking about redefining their relationships and their identities. And we've talked that their identities may be different to the identities in school. The values of the home may be different to the values of the classroom. And how do you bridge those things? Well, I want you to watch a video now of a boy and a, a moment in one child's life of a huge transition. This is from the video Kess, from the film Kess. And I don't know if you've seen it. It's set in, I think it's in Barnsley, and I think it's uh, sort of 1960s, early 70s. A film by Ken Loach, wonderful film. And the boy has just come back from the head teacher's study. He's had his hands caned for smoking. He's got back in the classroom, and the teacher's started on him now, telling him to tell a story. And he's saying, I haven't got a story. I don't know any stories. And the teacher pushes him, so come on. And one child in the class recognises that there's something Billy does. He's got a bird, and he's always spending time with this bird, he says. OK, the teacher says, come on, tell us about it. And you'll see the change. You'll see the change from this insignificant child who's got low self-esteem, always in trouble, to becoming somebody the class admire, somebody who's got status with the class, with the teacher. Now, come on, come on tell us about this art. Where'd you get it from? I found it, sir. Where? In the woods. Where'd you keep it? In the shed. All right, come out. No. No, it happened. So I thought, well, I better walk back and pick it up. So while I was walking back, I saw a flying chicken like a bomb. About a yard off the floor, light lightning, head still, and you couldn't hear wings. I wanted sound front wings, and straight onto the globe, wham! And she'll grab me for me. I just think that moment in Kess is really wonderful. And what I notice about him is his body language, his eyes, his face, the way he starts whispering and talking in an elevated way. That's really quite phenomenal. He's gone from being a child who had nothing to say to being a child who's got something so convincing to say, it really affects the rest of the class. And we have to find those moments for, for children in, in school to actually reaffirm their identity. In the third section, we start to think about exploring spaces because, of course, um, the, prim the primary place where children learn is in the classroom. But the most interesting spaces to learn are often outside the classroom. And uh, students are often afraid, un afraid to take a risk and venture beyond the classroom. And I really want them to start thinking about the joy and the, and the fun of exploring spaces, valuing the places where the children live, the, the town, the, the street, and um, even the school grounds and places where they don't normally explore. Just on this slide here, you can see by taking children outdoors, they're starting to look over, to explore things, dragging their hands, dragging a stick around a fence. Every step of their journey, they'll be testing it out along the way. 
and we kind of keep children tucked away in a little classroom all day long, when really the place where they'll learn best or they'll learn most is the world right beyond the classroom. I'm not suggesting we go outside every day, but what I am asking you to do is to think about how you use the school grounds, how you use the corridor outside your classroom, how you use the gate or the road outside the school, or the children's town, or you take them to the seaside. You might want to do a project about the seaside. If you can take the children to the seaside, great. But what if you can't? Bring the seaside to them. Recreate your classroom into the seaside with deck chairs and sand and ice creams and seagull noises, for goodness sake, if you need to. But you need to create some kind of authentic setting for the learning to take place. Because otherwise, learning and teaching is just a paper exercise. The national curriculum is there, and it gives us guidance for what to do. But why is it there? I think it's there because it's not about the stuff on the paper. It's about getting children to see the world through the eyes of a geographer, through the eyes of a musician, through the eyes of an artist or a scientist or a writer. That's the real power of the curriculum subjects. It's about discipline, it's about subject knowledge, and those things are really important, but only in as much as they help individual children interact with their world. So you want to write a poem about leaves, and about autumn? What do you do? You could go to the window, that would be a good start but you could go outside too. You could put your coats on and you can go outside and walk through the leaves. And when you've walked through the leaves and smelt the leaves and stuck your hands through the leaves, maybe then you can start writing about the leaves. And once you've written about the leaves, maybe then you can start writing the music about the leaves or painting the pictures about the leaves. I think that learning has to be related to the outside world. It's not related to the test. It's related to individual children who live in, a, in, a, in the real world. And we know things about their brain. And neuroscience and all these things may help us in future years understand about learning. Or they may confirm what we already know. But there are things we do know. There are optimal states for learning. The one thing about optimal states is maybe that the challenge is high, but the stress is low. What happens if the stress is high and the challenge is high? Fear. What happens if the, st if the stress is low and the challenge is low? Boredom. <laughs> So you might think, what's the optimal state? Chick Set Me High talks about flow. That's interesting. What are, the, what are the occasions where you are so absorbed in the thing you're doing, you forget to notice time? You forget to notice your aches and pains or your headache. You forget to think about your worries because you're so absorbed in the very thing that you're doing, you forget all those peripheral things. What could that be for you? I think I have a flow experience when I'm washing up. Washing up is a nice moment for just disappearing into your head and forgetting the world around you. But where are your flow experiences? And where are the children's flow experiences? It's quite a nice way of thinking about the way that they're absorbed in their work. And the orchestrated immersion aspect of understanding how the brain learns best. And then active processing, getting them to share their writing, not as children in school, but a real sense of writers sharing their writing. I wonder what that is. Now, I don't think we'd see that if we stayed in the classroom. And you might see a tree, but I see an animal there. I see an animal's head, a bit of a dinosaur thing with spiky things. Can you see it? A sort of a snout type of thing. Now, if I'd seen that, I might want to start writing about it. I wonder where it lives, and I wonder what it eats, and I wonder why no one's ever seen one before. And I wonder what, what its habitat is like. Maybe we could do some science work based on this mythical creature up here. Maybe instead of starting with the real, we start with the imaginary. Or maybe once we've done the real, we can move on to the imaginary. We can reinvent it. We can start seeing spaces, not as they are, but as they aren't, in fact. I think the one thing I want you to think about is yourself as a learner, not just as a fount of knowledge pouring forth the things that you know, but working with the children. Here's a student teacher being led blind, blindly by some children who are going to show him something close up. Sometimes you have to allow the children to take the lead. Sometimes listen to them, see what they've got to say to you, and, and go and explore areas that they know, and let them show you the local streets where things happen. I want to show you a short video uh, clip of some children playing in a space where they've, this is Dungeness, uh, a pretty nasty bit of shoreline with a nuclear power station behind it. Watch how they play. But when you get closer, not all is what it seems. Hello, I'm Andy the Moss. And I'm Harriet the Moss. And today we're going exploring. I wonder who we'll find. Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, hello. What's your name? 
My name is Percy Prickly. Hello, Prickly Percy. Hi, Prickle people. Prickle, Prickle, Prickle. That's not very nice. Oh. Ooh, just lie on the floor. Me too, me too. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> OK, it's slightly mad in a way, but then the children are having fun playing in the space with those characters. And they're starting to think about the characterization, characterization of those characters. At what point is the point where they do the writing of the script? Now they've done the playing, they can start to think about the development of those characters. I'm not sure as they would have got the same results had they gone straight into the writing of the script without that opportunity to play. And I'm not sure I could give them that opportunity to play had it not happened outside in the open air. I don't think we could have recreated that in the classroom. But you will come to the end of your exploring when you get back to the place you started with and start seeing it differently. Start seeing it almost like it's for the first time all over again. Like going back to somewhere you lived 20 years ago. You see it differently. And that's what we want children to do, to explore and to reinvent, to rediscover the spaces that they live in. In the final section, I'll try and bring all of these ideas together. We will spend a little bit of time thinking about ourselves as learners and our strengths as learners and also our weaknesses as learners as well. And from this understanding of ourselves as learners, begin to rediscover ourselves as teachers and as lifelong learners who are committed to belonging to a community which values learning in the future. Brings us back to a question, what kind of teacher will you be? What are the things you think are important and in your book are going to inform your philosophy? How will you be remembered? What do you want the children to remember about you when they've left you, when you see them in the street? How do you want them to think about you? What do you want them to remember you for? I suspect that first of all you need to know yourself as a learner. You need to know in which way you have backbone for learning. You need to know in which ways you support your learning and you are resourceful. As Guy Claxton's model here, building learning power is really quite useful. And what about children's resilience in their learning? And what about your reflection? What opportunities do you take to think about yourself as a learner, as a developing learner, as somebody who's overcome so many barriers? And in what way can you use your understanding of yourself as a learner to support children as developing learners? And David Perkins said, this he calls the mouse that roars. People learn much of what they have, a reasonable opportunity and motivation. Just having you as their teacher might be the thing that lights a fire, the very fact they've got you and not the other person. That is so valuable, but you have to celebrate the very thing that you're bringing to them. And how a gardener, asking questions to which they actually crave the answer. They, Isabella craved the keys. It's that sort of thing. In what way do they crave answers? I thought I'd invented this and I discovered John Dewey had got there before me. But in a way, we represent the subject knowledge. We know all about subjects and we're now starting to think about children as learners. So we're starting to bridge this gap. But in whose interest is all this? Why do children learn music? Is it so that they'll be the concert performers of the future? Is it so that they'll pass on the heritage? Or is it something about getting children to think, to problem solve, to, to use their skills, to negotiate? to interact with other people in their learning and to develop themselves as rich and varied learners through all these different areas of the curriculum. I don't think it is about creating the new sportsmen or the Olympic world champions of the future. They'll kind of emerge anyway. This is about every individual child growing and developing through a rich and varied curriculum. And sometimes the curriculum roams. This is my little idea. Sometimes we go with a child's interest. Sometimes the curriculum subject will take us in a different direction and we're ready to support them as they go off in a new area. Ultimately, you've got to be the teacher you would have wanted as a child. Who, would it, who was that person? And how can you start being that person for other people? Well, there are some ideas there that you might like to think about about authentic experiences, about you considering yourself as an ongoing lifelong learner, developing your range of interests and overcoming your own barriers. So as you go on with the excitement of learning for the rest of your life, write your own book. Just read that. This is the last slide. Try not to get anxious in your teaching. It talks about the way we might be suppressed, but that somehow through all of this, we have to remember the human interaction that's going on. Do you like the quote? It was by me last Sunday evening when I wrote it, so you won't find it in a book. But it's what I want to tell you, and it's what I'd like you to go away with at the end of today. Thank you very, very much for listening to me for so long.
Thank you. The main thing I'd like the students to take away from all of this is that really what we want them to develop is a very individual and very personal approach to their teaching where they take children on a journey uh, in their learning of rediscovery and more importantly of change and that they value that change not for the results it gives but for the impact it has on individual children now and well into the future.